Welcome once again. This is Communication Across the Ocean. I'm Jeff Gentry. Today meeting with Felicity Williams, who is a teacher here at Mozart Drama School and Kindergarten. And uh, just to get started, Felicity, thank you very much for being with us today. And tell us a little bit about Mozart. Mozart started in 1994 on a whim. Do you want to hear the secret story? Sure. <laughs> I don't tell it to everybody, but I will. The neighbours had bought the property. It was a run-down derelict church. I was a tutor um, in education. And even though I had really good lecture notes, after four or five years, you're doing the same thing because it's, it works. So I was at a crossroad. The neighbours had a square dance here, and it was wonderful. The old church had bales of hay and everything in it. And uh, I went out to the old concrete steps, and they had fairy lights in the trees. And this is the embarrassing bit. It's not embarrassing, but they might lock me up. The building <laughs> spoke to me. <laughs> and no building has done that. And the building said, I want to hear the sound of children's laughter. And I turned to my husband and said, I'm going to open a school. And he never argued. We just kept writing out checks. In those days, it was a lot easier getting all the resource consents. Mm -hmm. And we opened with 36 children. We now have up to 100 in the preschool and another 100 doing drama. In 1995, the drama school started a year after we opened, and then another four years later, we started a television production company to make children's TV reflecting live action, children involved in imaginative play. So um, here we are. Right, and, mm. and the, uh, the production company that you had uh, created a show that was, uh, was that on Canterbury Television, or was that all over the country? It was national TV, and, funded and by that show. the Dress Up Box. Um, the Dress Up Box was television for children by children. And even because there are certain models, there's the, the, the oversized puppet model, um, there is a, there's animation, which is everywhere, um, and then there's the live action model. And that's much harder to do for younger children, because people say it can't be done. Never worked with animals, whether it's children, we did all three, <laughs> shot in location. <laughs> um, animals, children, and... The third weather. and weather. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, I'm very proud of it. Yeah. Uh, we we didn't get a lot of funding. We had to make do, and it sold to um, TVO, but it didn't go international because it's very it's very difficult. Right. But it still plays in New Zealand, and it plays on in flight, and it is a children's classic. Wonderful. Mm. Well, let's talk a little bit more about you. You are a native of Christchurch. Mm -hmm. And I've found that a lot of people who live here have lived here their whole lives. What is it about this city that keeps people here? It's not so much the city, I think it's New Zealand, is that New Zealand claims people from the ground up through their feet. And so people will travel absolutely assiduously. Because we have this thing about wanting to see what's it's so far for us. Mm -hmm. And but there is a real pull, and in the South Island, the pull is to the southern lakes and central Otago, and the mountains, and the rivers, and um, the land, really. We entertain a lot of overseas visitors, and they say things like, well, we have silence, we can obtain silence, we can obtain horizons. And really, I guess 20 years ago, overseas you went to get the new trends, but now everything's evened out. Right. So it's lifestyle. Very good. Well, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's been a beautiful country for us to visit for, for uh, about six weeks now. And so um, you attended University of Canterbury yes. and studied music yes. there. So um, I'm not sure how many. I know that you are violin. I've seen you play piano. How many musical instruments do you I play? I did degrees in violin, voice, singing, uh, voice, piano, but did my honors in composition. And did a lot of composition, um, but it's very hard to make a living. Right. And so you do end up doing teaching. And then I, the pivotal year for me was getting a national residency in 1988 called National Composer in Schools. This doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it's quite prestigious, and you work for a year in schools as a composer. And a teacher would say to you, my clarinets can play four notes, write them something for next week's concert. So it's it's wow. it's quite amazing leveler, right? And if you can't meet that, so it was wonderful. I had to work within quite strict guidelines according to children's ability, 
and my most successful work was done at primary school level and intermediate, not so much high school because you're much more curriculum bound. I hate curriculum. Mm -hmm. So for me, not having to have one was brilliant right. because I could just look at the children work at what they needed. Okay, so you're, are you still composing even today? No, I wrote 52 songs for the dress up box and that exhausted me. Right, that's a lot. I can improvise, I, I probably don't now, but um, I could again, mm -hmm. but I'm too busy. Right, busy writing a book? I'm writing a novel for nine year old girls, that's a highly speculative um, it's very hard to market ideas overseas, and um, I'm going to have a finished product. I'll have the first three chapters, and a synopsis of the mythology I've created, and we'll go to a New York literary agent and take it from there. Right, and you told me you're having meetings with people in Auckland and Los Angeles? I've got partners in Christopher Keenan in LA, and Wilson Main, who's completing his PhD on children's television in Adelaide. So we're a oh, partnership. Adelaide in Australia. Yes. Okay. So we're a partnership. Adelaide's very hot on structure. Brilliant. He's a brilliant structurist. So um, Keenan in the States has worked for everywhere at Warner's the lot. He's just a brilliant, with character, motivation, and I have got a crazy imagination. Great. So I need to be pulled in. I need to know that everything drives a story. So right. it's been fun. And you said that there isn't a lot of literature for nine-year-old uh, age girls compared to older or even I'll younger. specify what I mean by that. You've got brilliant stuff like Pullman with Lyra and the, the Golden Compass. Uh, what people don't quite understand with girls, and I even think even though Pixar's Braid was magnificent, mm -hmm. She fought with a bow and arrow. She needed to fight with a hair clip <laughs> or a ribbon. Okay. You see, that, that's very right, general. Right, right. I'm saying that you've got to understand the motivation for girls to be loquacious, right. to use sarcasm and verbal um, animosity, more than just saying we're going to make a movie about a strong girl. Right. And okay, she's um, she ends up being a bit boy like. Right. It's right, not this. Right. The protagonist in my story is not a tomboy. She's right. totally and utterly into what girls are into, and she uses that in her quest. Very good. Well, I think it'll time out just right, because at, at the moment, you know, this is my prediction, at the moment your book is ready for publication, my little girl will be happy to read it. You oh, know, good. She'll probably be <laughs> seven or eight and, and ready to uh, venture into that sort of thing. So uh, there are just so many interesting things for us to talk about. Are you a musician who does drama or a dramatist or a you know an uh, actress who does uh, music? That's very interesting. I was born to older parents. My mother was 44, my dad was seven years younger, and they lavished everything on us. I remember Dad going to the wardrobe and getting down a violin. I had no choice. I wanted to learn ballet. Dad was adamant. He just saw little girls with red lipstick and he was... <laughs> <laughs> I put a broomstick in the room and tried to teach myself. So I've always loved movement. Um, I'm relatively unscarred from that, but I do think children... I do think I should have been allowed to go. So we got given music. And fortunately, I was very driven and precocious. Consequently, I run a place that really enables those kinds of children, because I was one. And I appreciate and love and draw that out of children rather than say you've got to tone it down. Right, right. I um, noticed that about you and I, and I encourage that too. Yes. Um, that I'd rather have children that are a little too loud when yes. they speak than a little too quiet. If you're not in that zone yourself, you don't appreciate it, you get mm -hmm. threatened. I mean, a, teachers can get threatened by really bright, precocious children, but I kind of love it. Right. I do, because I was one. And there were several teachers that didn't like it. I know, you just can't squash it. So um, I was a musician, and it wasn't until I got that composer in school's job. I never did drama, I never did stage acting. But what I worked out that year was that children absolutely thrived if you mixed the lot together. And I think it's to do with dispositions, learning dispositions. There's visual modalities, there's movement. So the minute you say to a child, we're going to do, um, well, we're doing Brer Rabbit find a way that the fox can walk and it doesn't have to be the same as everybody else's right. and one child will automatically go to a drum so I say that's actually all right as long as it's not everybody and it's not above the ear decibel damage point which it can get actually mm -hmm. uh, you find the way to be the fox and so the blend you give the rhythm which is going to be 6-8 a swing the rabbit's going to be bluegrass 
you know. So then you get the movement comes out, the movement comes out of the music, and it all enhances the other things. So I've actually picked up the drama along the way. I've actually picked up a, a specific way of teaching drama that's involved in. It's not a beer hall out there. Children can construct props and scenarios. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They love that, even up to the age of 13. Right, right. They love grabbing the furs and creating a small desert. It's, so that's the visual thing. I think it's quite powerful. Great. Mm. And so, have you ever performed as an actress on stage? Mm. No. I would have pegged you for someone who did professional theatre. Thank you. Because of your, <laughs> your natural um, ability to um, you know, be creative and express yourself and, and things like that. It, I don't know if you're writing a novel, but you might think about it. I mean, I'm a pretty good spotter, a spotter okay. of talent. And so um, we saw Wind in the Willows on yes, the Avon River, which was fantastic. It was. And so I could imagine you doing some professional theater. The washerwoman, so. right? People said, was that Felicity <laughs> being the washerwoman? <laughs> <laughs> very good. Well, Felicity Williams, thank you very much for being with us. You can tell that uh, we don't just have talented people at the University of Canterbury. Christchurch is filled with brilliant people. And thanks so much okay, for being nice. with us. Okay, nice. Right. Great. And we'll see you again on Communication Across the Ocean.